nomine Patris et Filii, et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Well, thank you all for braving the, the weather this morning to come out. Um, uh, the commemorated saints for, for today are Saints um, Faustinus and Hovite. Uh, these are brothers in the early church who uh, they were uh, arrested for preaching the truth of Christ, <coughs> defying the, the emperor's edicts. And they were, um, in order to make an example of them, they were brought into this giant amphitheater in front of uh, 12,000 um, spectators uh, to be uh, eaten by wild beasts. Um, so this is, this is the way of the world to, um, that it uh, um, you know, attempts to punish and to humiliate Christ. So you have this huge spectacle, 12,000 people. Faustinus and Hovite uh, are thrown into the wild beasts and, and nobody's ever seen this before. Uh, the wild beasts won't touch them. Uh, and, and I think Faustinus and Ovidio, there's this, this, this huge miracle. Um, anyways, it ends up converting the entire amphitheater. So 12,000 people convert. Like that had the complete opposite effect of what the emperor was going for. And that's how, um, that's how God works. What, what the enemy does to, um, uh, uh, what, what it thinks it does to, to stamp out Christ or to humiliate Christ actually ends up doing the complete opposite. So um, that's, that should be our lesson, not to... What is it? Not to listen or not to pay attention to the wisdom of this world. Well, you know that wouldn't be prudent, or you can't do that, or can't do that. Or um, God can do anything, right? So don't pay attention to what what seems to be this or that, or what the world would tell you to do. Don't listen to that at all. Absolutely not. Preach Christ boldly, and that's when miracles will happen. Uh, but for today, so uh, Saint Claude de la Colombière uh, in the Novus Calendar. Uh, he was a uh, Jesuit priest and spiritual director to St. Margaret Mary Alaco in the late 17th century. Uh, he was born in 1641 in southern France, uh, one of seven children, and four of the seven ended up entering religious life. And he himself would enter the Jesuits at 17 years old. Um, and he was ordained a priest in 1669 at 28, and he soon gained notice for the clarity and soundness of his sermons. Uh, he preached against, very much against Jansenism, and he also had a great devotion uh, to the Sacred Heart of Jesus, which, as you know, uh, was promoted. That, that, that was before, at this time, 1669, uh, the Sacred Heart of Jesus was just beginning to gain um, uh, its um, uh, uh, fame. And in fact, it would be St. Claude de la Colombière with Margaret Mary Alaco who would end up being the, the great uh, propagators of this, this devotion. Now, he was, um, <clears throat> as I said, he preached very much against Jansenism, and that was a terrible heresy which really um, wrecked a lot of souls in the 17th century and even, even afterwards. In fact, it even, even felt its effects way up to um, the Second Vatican Council. Uh, indeed, uh, Jansenism is it, its... Um, it's a theological movement, and it was primarily active in France, and it emphasized uh, original sin, human depravity, and the absolute necessity of divine grace, as well as advocating predestination. It was heavily influenced by Calvinism and repeatedly condemned by uh, the church hierarchy. Uh, the Jansenists, uh, for their turn, they were kind of like the modernists of today. They would agree with the church's condemnations on the surface, but they would continue to teach the substance of their heresy under more disguised forms, which is the worst, the worst way of, um, it's the worst form of pride and the worst kind of heresy, which, you, which is essentially duplicity. Yes, I agree with what you're saying, but you change the meaning of the words to mean what you want them to mean. And so uh, it's called, called Jansenism uh, because the founder of the movement was Cornelius Jansen, and he was a professor, I think, in, in Belgium, <clears throat> but he wasn't really its promoter. His works were spread far and wide by a friend of his, Abbot uh, John Duvergier, who was in France. And um, uh, Jansenism wasn't really, um, Jansenism was kind of the substance, and we often hear that, that this, this is a term, a, a, an angry traditionalist uh, Catholic will be referred to as a Jansenist. Uh, but more probably, properly, the term is rigorist. A rigorist 
is, is one who favors the more strict interpretation of the law. In fact, a, a rigorist will favor, favor the strictest interpretation of the law versus one that is, that is less strict, but even probable. Uh, the Jansenist position taught absolute rigorism, uh, which was that in a conflict of opinions, if there was any possibility, any possibility at all, that, that a, a strict interpretation might be possible, you had to take that position even if the more lenient position was overwhelmingly probable. Like you always had to do the most strictest, rigorous interpretation possible. And that was condemned, repeatedly condemned by the church, and that was what was taught by Jansenism. Now, and, and, and sadly, it, it was a... Um, uh, I mean, at this time in France, 1600s France, that was the flowering of, uh, you know, uh, um, um, spirituality. Uh, you know, you had um, the, the lead up to it. You had, um, uh, well, Philip Neri, you had uh, um, um, uh, Francis de Sales, St. Jane Francis de Chantal, you have St. Margaret Mary Alaco. You know, you just had this, this, this beautiful spirituality. But the trouble, the trouble when, when um, sanctity and the spiritual life uh, become popular or attractive, uh, everybody wants to be that. And whether they have good motives or, or bad motives, everybody wants to appear like what's in vogue. And if sanctity is in vogue, people want to look like they're holy. And, and Jansenism makes you appear to be very holy because it's like, oh, look at what I can do because I love God so much, right? And, and, and the love God so much part, part just falls away and ends up being, look at what I can do. Right? Look at how holy I am because of all the fasting and all this. And, oh, I'm so strict. I always do the strictest thing. It's just, it's just a big pride thing. And so Jansenism can very much appeal to um, you know, the ignorant and the proud. The ignorant because they don't know any better and they think, well, I guess this is what I'm supposed to do. And the proud because um, it's kind of like somebody who finds out that they're good at something and they don't have to put forth any effort. They can just suddenly feel like I I'm great at this and I'm a saint. And... So it's, it's, just, it's just a terrible um, trap to fall into. I guess the Old Testament version would be Phariseeism, right? Which is what, what their problem was. So that affected France and that, that poisoned so many minds. I um, mean, it was, it was most active in, in France at the time of Claude de la Colombière. And it was so bad that, that when um, uh, uh, it, was, it was the French priests had to flee due to the Napoleonic Wars, they fled to Spain. And the bishops of Spain would not let the French priests preach or hear confessions because of their Jansenism, their rigorism. And, and, the, and the French spread it to Ireland and the Irish spread it to America. And you, you hear a lot about this, this excessive rigorism in America and, and bishops today, even priests today will talk about how we shouldn't focus on sin and hell and damnation. There was a lot of that influence from the Irish priests in the early um, um, late 1800s, early 1900s, and, and the Vatican II was a backlash against that in, in many ways, a backlash against Jansenism and rigorism, which was already a heresy. It was already condemned. There didn't need to be a backlash. Everybody knew it was wrong. But anyway, so there, there, you, you see how error can, can, can continue for centuries. So Claude de la Colombière was, was, was uh, uh, preaching against this, and... Um, Eventually, five years after his ordination, he was assigned as spiritual director to a group of sisters of the Visitation Order at Paris le Monial, among whom was the young nun Margaret Mary Alaco. And she had suffered very much, as she writes in her diary, from spiritual directors who did not understand her. Her whole community didn't understand her uh, and her visions of the Sacred Heart. Uh, but when Claude de la Colombière came, he understood her and believed her, and a tremendous relief to her. Um, but he took it one step further and told her that not only did he believe her, uh, she needed to write these down, and, and, make, and he was going to publish them. She, she did not want that at all, uh, but he, he insisted, and, and she agreed, and he, um, he helped to get the devotion accepted, approved, and eventually popularized. And as I mentioned, he already had a devotion to the Sacred Heart. Uh, the, the, the Mass and the Office had already been written in the church by St. John Eudes about a hundred years uh, previously. But it has kind of a sad ending. Um, just three years after being assigned to that, that convent, he was assigned by King Louis XIV to go to England as the spiritual director to Mary Modena, who was the wife of, of who would become the future King James II of England. 
And this, so as we know, England was, was, was long Protestant by this time, by about 100 years. But King James, or who, who was a duke of, um, the duke of something at the time, he wasn't king yet, but he was in line to, to inherit the throne. And he had converted and become a Catholic, and all the Protestants were just, um, you know, in an uproar that this, this man who could very well be king might be Catholic and undo all of the Anglican church, et cetera, that had been going on. So that was a huge fear. Um, I mean, it would have been wonderful if it, King James II ended up, he did become king, but his Catholicism was very weak and he really did nothing with it. Uh, but the result for Claude de la Colombière was that he was spiritual director to Mary Modena. And during all this, this fear and, and um, uh, uh, of, of, you know, James becoming the king, uh, Claude was imprisoned. Uh, he was imprisoned uh, and uh, under the pretense of attempting to uh, subvert the throne and the crown and so on, because Charles II was still king at this time. And so Claude was seen as this, he was an open, open Catholic priest from France, you know, just, uh, so he, he was imprisoned um, in, in, and kept for um, some time, uh, I think it was a number of years, treated horribly. Um, he, the only reason he was not martyred was due to the intervention of King Louis XIV and, of course, uh, James II. So Claude ended up banished from England, but his health was ruined, and he attempted to return to his former duties, but um, uh, was unable to. And I think it was just a few years, or maybe not even a year, uh, after being released, he succumbed to death. And he died the day, 15 February, at 41 years old. Uh, but the day after his death, St. Margaret Mary Alaco uh, had a vision that Claude needed no prayers as he was already in heaven. Uh, he was what we would have called um, one of those white martyrs. Um, so uh, quite the story of, of, of Claude de la Colombière and also uh, kind of a little bit about uh, rigorism and Jansenism, which was infecting France uh, at that time and, and would spread its errors. And, and, but that, that was the point of the Sacred Heart. The Sacred Heart devotion is all about the love of Christ. And so when you have a heresy of, of, um, you know, of anger and justice and this is overwhelming um, uh, uh, just rigorism, um, of course, you know, you're going to have Christ at the same time uh, tempering that with, 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 with his love. So um, I would say, you know, there's a beautiful actually prayer. That, uh, it's called an act of confidence in God that Claude de la Colombier wrote. And uh, it's, it's, it's just overwhelmingly a positive in the hope and in the trust of God. It's just like, you know, I have no, there's, there's one section that says, um, others may expect happiness in their riches and talents, or, um, uh, you know, m many others lean on the innocence of their life, the rigors of their penance, on the amount of their good works, or the fervor of their prayers. But, uh, you know, I have none of that. I myself, Lord, all my confidence lies in confidence itself. Uh, you, O oh Lord, are my only hope. Uh, and that's really what we should do, is we shouldn't have confidence, even in our good works, our penances, you know, our long fastings and prayers and vigils, uh, that really, that is not going to save us. That's not our salvation. That disposes us to salvation. What all those things do is it disposes us to receive the, the, the grace of God, whatever that may be, the salvation of God, however that may come, right? That is so important for us to remember that. Prayers and sanctity, or prayers and fasting and penances, that's not what makes us a saint. You're not, you're not achieving sanctity. You're disposing yourself for sanctity and God gives it to you, right? God gives it to us. That is so important to understand that, that, that you know, no matter what we do, it's, it's nothing. It's less than nothing in the eyes of God. It's what we receive, and God, he gives it, he doesn't give it. Uh, he gives it to one, but not another. He gives more, he gives less. He gives in proportion, out of proportion, right? Remember the t parable of the talents, or the, the parable of the, uh, the workers in the vineyard. You know, one worked one hour, the other worked 12 hours, they, all, they got the same. It, it doesn't matter, it's more than we deserve. Everything's more than we deserve. So let us be like Cla St. Claude de la Colombière and, and hope in God above all, trust in the sacred heart of Jesus, and not worry if we're imprisoned, if, if we're, um, if we die young, we, it doesn't matter. Uh, trust in the mercy of God. Uh, so God bless you all. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.